look, I get it. Everyone, including myself, was surprised that Taylor Stubblefield was fired from Penn State. But honestly, don't be. Because it's his fault. You are Locked On Nittany Lions. Your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Nittany Lions. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. My name is Zach Seiko, your host as always, and Taylor Stubblefield has been fired by Penn State. He is no longer the wide receivers coach. It's simple. It's his fault. We're going to talk about all of that today, including uh, who could replace him. Who's going to be the next man up at the wide receiver uh, coach spot? And we're also going to talk about Dante Cephas, who committed not even maybe max 30 minutes after Taylor Stubblefield was relieved of his duties. So let's start off with that. Taylor Stubblefield was fired by Penn State. This wasn't a mutual agreement. This wasn't uh, Taylor Stubblefield taking another position. It kind of it seemed like it came out of nowhere, right? Because it did. It was a firing. Uh, no one was really expecting this, but the simplicity of it all, don't overthink it. He just wasn't getting the job done. He just wasn't. Don't you don't you find it odd? You sit back and you say, okay, Drew Aller, five-star quarterback. And in an offensive line that is revamped, it's reloaded, it's not being rebuilt. It has four out of the five starters from a year ago. And honestly, Hunter Norzad was a co-starter. So let's let's say four and a half, right? Almost 100% of the offensive line is back. Uh, you have openings for both the number one and the number two wide receiver spot. It's an open competition. Why hasn't a single wide receiver from the transfer portal committed to Penn State? That's really the question, and you you don't have an answer. Why doesn't someone want to play with a five-star quarterback? Why doesn't someone want to work with one of the best offensive coordinators in the country and Mike Yurcich? And yes, that is the case. Penn State can be a pass-happy offense, even though I still think they're going to be pretty balanced. They'll be run first because you have Nicholas Singleton. You have Katron Allen. However, at the end of the day, Mike Yurcich does want to throw the football a little more, and he has. At least he wants to get the weapons around Drew Aller to make that the case. Um, But it... It was really odd with the way that Penn State is able to recruit James Franklin. People want to come to Penn State. It's still one of the premier programs in all of the country. And yet nobody was transferring and nobody was committing. Um, Yes, they got Dante Cephas. That's awesome. But how did it happen? It happened 30 minutes after Taylor Stubblefield had put the notice out on, on social media that he was thankful for the opportunity. And James Franklin said he thanked him for his service and that they'll be conducting, conducting a national search. But I find that even more of a coincidence that, you know, Dante Cephas, it it felt like he might've been on the fence. There's, there's a few situations here that uh, really put Taylor Stubblefield in hot water. And I think number one was just the fact that there wasn't, there wasn't any electricity. Uh, Penn state felt like it was still really limited in the competition for some of these key transfer portal targets at wide receiver. They weren't always out in front. They were maybe third or fourth and they, and they struggled to get uh, the attention of some guys and Dante Seif is right out of the gate, put his name in the transfer portal in December came and visited and Penn State couldn't get him locked up right away. He was still looking around. He was interested in Pitt. Pitt. He was interested in UCLA. And that should have been a, an instant commitment. That should have been a lock. And, and it wasn't. That's one instance of Taylor Stubblefield just not doing his job. Uh, the second part of this is the, the Devin Carter situation. I think the Dante Cephas uh, situation might have been the final straw here because the rumor that was that he was going to commit to Pittsburgh, that he was going to become a Panther, move back closer to home. He's from that Penn Hills area in Pennsylvania. And maybe that was the final straw. And they said, you know what? Um, You're just not checking off enough boxes anymore. Uh, Here, the Devin Carter situation is a little murkier uh, when you think about it. Let's unpack that again, because we we picked on Devin Carter because it it felt strange. You know, he decommitted quietly And then he ultimately picked West Virginia last second. But I got to feel that Taylor Stubblefield dropped the ball here too. Carter verbally committed right after the Rose Bowl 
when Penn, Penn State won over Utah, and there was no official visit. There was really limited prior contact from what I've gathered, and you can go check that. That That is a fact that Devin Carter had not really been in uh, constant communication with Penn State. There weren't, there wasn't that official visit. And then all of a sudden, all these cards fall on the table. And it's like, we have this receiver that just verbally committed to us and, and we've had limited contact with him. What, what is going on? Um, so that, I, I wonder if Taylor Stubblefield uh, played a hand in that. Uh, we should be a little suspicious about that because he committed. It sounded like he was all on board. The uh, The application fees were paid. He was getting set up with classes, and then all of a sudden he just doesn't enroll in the spring semester, and, and he ultimately flips to West Virginia. He did commits quietly and then goes to the Mountaineers. I, I find that to be really weird. I find that to be suspicious, uh, and that's, that's Stubblefield's responsibility. Something went wrong. And I, I just think that he, he bears a lot of responsibility for that situation uh, in itself. And then Parker Washington should have come back. He, he, he could have come back and he didn't. I find that a little eerie too. Uh, this was a guy who could have used another season at Penn state. He had the season ending surgery. He's definitely going to take a hit in his draft status, his draft stock, and he doesn't come back. He, he could have been a second or a first round pick with one more good season. So Parker Washington, I get it. You, you dream of the NFL. That's what all these kids do. They want to go to the pros. I, I get that. But it, it would have made so much sense for Parker Washington to come back and play another season at Penn State. And as the wide receivers coach, Stubblefield bears responsibility in that regard. So it, it's not only the fact that there was struggles recruiting and getting players to commit in the transfer portal. It's also the fact that you, you lost veterans that really should have stuck around that you weren't able, you weren't even able to keep your in-house uh, players happy, the guys that were already there. And what do we know about the, the players that are currently there? And they have meetings constantly in the off season. Uh, maybe there were some players that said, you know, they weren't getting along with coach. I, that's complete speculation. I don't want to go any further than that because Taylor Stubblefield did, in fact, do a solid job over three seasons. But at this point in time, I'm not sure what happened, but uh, there something just really <laughs> went off the rails here. And, and that's why he was let go. He was, in fact, fired. But when we move on, we're going to talk about the replacements for Taylor Stubblefield, uh, including just a, an assessment of how Stubblefield did from 2020 to 2022. And, and then later on, Dante Cephas did commit his player profile, why he could be Penn State's best receiver next season. That is all coming up next. Today's episode is sponsored by Built Bar. Are you looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all of the fat and the calories? Then you've got to try Built Bar. And we just got through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat a little healthier this year. And if you're like me where you want to get healthier, but you don't want to compromise the taste, then, man, I've got the thing for you, and that is the Built Bar. you got to try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious, and you won't think that they're good for you. It's the perfect New Year's resolution. That, that's how good they taste. What makes Built Bars so good, you might ask? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievably tasty flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond. And I'm not, I'm not sure how Built does it. I'm really not. Uh, these bars taste like a candy bar and while maintaining those amazing macros. And what's even better is that they are healthy. Only 130 calories and 4 grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And, and now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering from the Built Bars at Built.com. Now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today and walk to the pharmacy section. Grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut pops. And if you're close to a Sam's Club, run in, grab a 13-bar box with hit flavors like brownie batter and churro. You can thank me later. 
Thanks again for making Locked On Nittany Lions your first listen every day. Make sure you check out the brand new show, and that is Locked On College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college basketball in one place, plus hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Zach Seiko, and Taylor Stubblefield is no longer the wide receivers coach at Penn State. Now, what did Stubblefield, before we get to possible replacements, I, I think it's fitting to look back over the three years because Stubblefield did do some good, just not enough when Penn State really needs it most. You know, if you are going to take that next step to be a national title, a college football playoff contender, and, and you got to win the Big Ten first, you can't just let that go. Uh, you you got to be on board. So if Stubblefield isn't doing his job correctly, then this this was just the time. It was the time for him to go. Uh, and it's a shame to see because he did do a decent job over the past few seasons. I think he deserves a lot of credit for Jahan Dotson's development. Uh, so where he failed with Parker Washington, uh, Jahan Dotson did in fact come back instead of settling for a fourth or a fifth round draft selection. He came back and, and Stubblefield does deserve a lot of credit for uh, Jahan Dotson becoming the first round receiver that he is. He he stabilized the position coach spot, that wide receiver coach spot, because it felt like it was always a revolving door, right? Somebody knew someone would stay for one season. They wouldn't work out. And, and it felt like there was finally some consistency with Taylor Stubblefield. So I, I wish him well, obviously. I want to see him succeed. Where do I think he goes next? I could see him winding right back up at Purdue. Purdue's his alma mater. Uh, he was a first-team All-Big Ten wide receiver in 2004. He had 16 touchdown receptions, 16 of them. Did go to the NFL, uh, but he's been a college coach. And, and it just if you look at the resume, he's bounced around quite a bit. I, I do wonder if he, he settles down and, and does go to Purdue. They got a new coaching staff. Uh, and maybe he would fit nicely in there as, as a wide receiver uh, coach or just an offensive, some form of, of coordinator, passing game coordinator maybe, um, because he's still got to jump up if he does intend to do that someday. Uh, so possible replacements for Coach Stubblefield. Uh, Penn State is conducting a national search. They made that they made that public. Uh, so it could be any candidate from all the way in, out in California to, to write in-house. Uh, someone that Penn State already has on staff could get promoted that way. We've seen Penn State do that with offensive coordinators. Uh, we've seen it done with Ty Howell, the tight ends coach, uh, going from an analyst to the tight ends coach. Uh, maybe that's the case here. If they're going to go with this national search, this is the only candidate that I want Penn State to hire, and that is former Penn State legend, wide receiver. You know where I'm going with this, especially if you watch Penn State football back in the 90s, and that is Bobby Ingram. I want Bobby Ingram to be the next wide receivers coach at Penn State. This is truly a no-brainer, and it's a home run if Franklin can bring him back to Happy Valley. I actually found it really weird that – he was never the the guy at some point in time, that he was never the wide receivers coach at any point in time. But the most important part of this, now he's available. He was most recently the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach with Wisconsin. Well, what happened at Wisconsin, folks? Paul Chris, the head coach, the guy who hired Bobby Ingram, is no longer there. He was fired in the middle of the season. Luke Fickle turned, uh, took over, and he's bringing all of his coaches with him. Uh, Angram displaced at this point. I can't imagine that he, he's not going to, he's not retaining that offensive coordinator spot with Luke Fickle and the Cincinnati staff coming over to Madison. So he's available and he's got the track record. We know about him being one of the best Penn state wide receivers in history, but how about him as a coach? What does he bring to the field as a coach? Because he spent time with the Baltimore Ravens. He was the wide receiver or tight ends coach. He, he alternated between the two, but he was with Baltimore from 2014 to 2021. Then he took over as Wisconsin's head uh, offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach as well. So uh, he's got the resume. Let's have the homecoming. Let's not waste any time. This should be the first and honestly, the only phone call. If Bobby Ingram turns it down, then, then so be it. But this, in my opinion, is the only right choice. Uh, Ingram, one of the greatest receivers in Penn State history. He has pro playing experience, had a good career in the NFL. He has college and NFL coaching experience. The roots are at Penn State. This is a no-brainer. Don't waste any time. Go get Bobby Ingram and make him the next Penn State wide receivers coach. If Ingram does, in fact, turn it down, maybe he wants to step away since you know Wisconsin unfolded the way it did. I, I could see that. Maybe he wants to go back to the NFL. 
um, Calvin Lowry would be my next choice. And I, I know what some of you were thinking. Okay, well, Calvin Ra Ra Lowry just got hired as an offensive analyst. How could you promote him that, that quickly? <laughs> Things change, you know. Uh, there wasn't uh, an open wide receiver coach spot when, when Lowry was interviewing to come back to Happy Valley. Uh, and like Bobby Ingram, Lowry spent time at Penn State. This is his alma mater as well. First team, all Big Ten in 2005. Uh, former NFL safety, played for a few seasons. Um, and at least he should be in line to interview. Like, th this is a good spot. And now, he played safety at Penn State. He played safety in the NFL. But if you didn't know this, now you do know. From 2015 all the way through the 2022 season, he's actually been the wide receivers coach at Tulsa. So he's got plenty of experience. He was brought in as an offensive analyst. And it, oddly enough, when, when players make those uh, positional switches, when, when they played both, let's take a Richard Sherman, for example. And I, I know this is kind of a, a very specific comparison, but Richard Sherman played wide receiver uh, at Stanford and then switched to cornerback for one season. So those guys that switch from what they because they understand both sides of the football. And I think that's what Calvin Lowry brings here because he was a defensive back. So he understands that position. He played it well. Now he's teaching. The wide receiver position, I, I think it's a good fit. Again, another guy that has Penn State roots. He's a young up-and-coming coach. Young up-and-coming coach. Penn State should lock in the 39-year-old now if Bobby Ingram is not available. Now, I, I could sit here with everyone and name a bunch of random wide receiver coaches around college football, even some guys in the pros, but I don't know anything about them that would make them inclined to take a job at Penn State. Uh, who knew Stubblefield was going to be the next wide receivers coach at, at Penn State? He didn't really have that many links to James Franklin or especially to Happy Valley. So th this is how it's going to happen. Penn State is going to bring in a wide receivers coach that has two things, one of two things, either one, a connection to James Franklin or two, a connection to Penn State. Uh, other possible names that have been thrown out there that I think are at least could be legitimate. Maybe they interview uh, Joe Daly. He is currently the Panthers wide receivers coach. Uh, depending on what they do there with the coaching staff, he could be displaced uh, and be looking for work. Uh, Joe Daly uh, does have a, a lot of experience. Uh, he was recently, in terms of the college ranks, was at Boston College, uh, and James Franklin does know him well. So that's one. Uh, Chris Beatty seems to be a name that the internet is throwing around, and I agree with it uh, too because the Chargers could be making a change with Brandon Staley. And, and at the time when this episode goes up, who knows what changes over the next couple of weeks. Uh, they're definitely going to meet with him after blowing a 27-point lead. That doesn't really look so good when there are already questions about your job security to begin with. Uh, Chris Beatty, if the staff does get reworked out in Los Angeles, uh, he's a guy that Penn State could bring in as well. Now, these are the not realistic options that I think could be fun. Uh, and don't you do do not take these seriously because these have actually been legitimately thrown out there. Of Well, this would be a great hire if Penn State targeted him. It's not going to happen. There's two of them that I had uh, because one did jump to mind. The, the first guy, though, that uh, everybody uh, thinks would be a home run hire, that they need to get him, and that's Donald Driver. Uh, look, I, I respect Donald Driver's playing career. I respect his relationship with James Franklin, but that's exactly what it is. It's just a really good friendship and a relationship. James Franklin coached him when he was with the Green Bay Packers, and, and Donald Driver had a phenomenal career. He's etched in Packer history, but he's not a coach. He doesn't have any coaching experience. It's not like, well, you know, he, he was here for a few seasons and then took some time off and just needs to get back into it. As much fun as it would be, it doesn't make any sense. It's just he he's not a coach. He's been an analyst. He's obviously coached as a father. He's been a father figure to Christian Driver. But uh, that that's really it. He doesn't have the resume to throw his hat into the ring and be the next wide receivers coach at Penn State. So that is not going to happen, uh, unfortunately, for anyone that had that pipe dream. Uh, the other name, the one that popped up to me was Joe Brady. Uh, now, Joe Brady uh, was the offensive coordinator with the Carolina Panthers. He was fired. But guess where he is now? He is the quarterback's coach with the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills are still in the playoffs. They're getting ready to play the Cincinnati Bengals. A lot of things are going well. Uh, he was an analyst once upon a time with Penn State from 2015 and, and 2016. And then, if you remember this, 
He was the wide receivers coach and the passing game coordinator with that legendary LSU team with uh, Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson. Exactly. That, that's the pipe dream that we all need to have if Penn State's going to bring any wide receivers coach in. I think Joe Brady, if he were available, I, I, it seems like he's landing on his feet. Uh, but if he was available, he and Bobby Ingram would be my number one and two choices. But I, I am all for Bobby Ingram. That is my pick. Have him sign on the dotted line and bring him back to Happy Valley. Uh, Joe Joe Brady, like I said, is just kind of like a whoa, what if uh, kind of moment here. It is locked on Nittany Lions. And with all the discussions around coaching, Penn State did get some good news. Dante Cephas is now a Penn State Nittany line. He's committed out of the transfer portal. He's finishing classes at Kent State, so he'll be here in the summer. And I'll tell you why I think he can be the best receiver at Penn State next season. That's coming up next. Finally, Penn State gets a commitment out of the transfer portal at wide receiver, and it's Dante Cephas. And he's going to be the best receiver for Penn State in 2023. Now, it's... This is, I just find it really interesting that he held off on his commitment. Apparently, he had a great visit. Everyone he talked to uh, was basically convinced that he was going to commit a- as soon as possible. It-, it didn't really happen right away. And now he's in. The Kent State transfer is in Sunday night after Stubblefield was fired, maybe all of 30 minutes before one announcement was made and then Cephas made his. Uh, it's going to be an uphill battle, I will admit that, because I know what everyone's going to think. Well, it, it should be Keandre Lambert-Smith. He'll be the best wide receiver. I just You got to watch some of the film for Dante Cephas. It's going to be an uphill battle for this reason and this reason alone. He's finishing classes at Kent State currently, um, which is good. This will make it an easy transition over to Penn State. Uh, won't have any a dilemma with credits. Right? Remember, there are academic decisions uh, being made here uh, when, when these things happen, how many credits are transferring over? Can you graduate on time? That kind of thing. And that's why Dante Cephas did stay at Kent state, but that's actually going to, it's going to hurt him. It's the big thing. And it's the only thing because you can't establish that kind of chemistry until the summer after the spring semester is over when you graduate. And then how soon are you going to get onto campus? Are you going to be there in the middle of May, end of May? Are you going to be there in June? Um, it's just kind of, you, you get that delay to start working with Drew Aller, getting in sync. Uh, So I hope they can get the ball rolling over June, July, and August, but uh, we'll see. Now, Dante Cephas has solid size. He's six foot one, a little undersized in in terms of weight. Uh, Penn State will probably have him add about maybe 10 or 15 pounds, but he's got afterburner speed. You watch the highlights from his best season, his sophomore year, when he was with Hayden Crum, and that's why you might look at Dante Cephas and see the the junior stats and be like, well, he regressed and he stepped back and he's not the same caliber receiver. Uh, It's who you had thrown to. Hayden Crum was an all-Mac type of quarterback. Uh, The next guy that they had from last season, eh, not as good. Uh, but what I really like about Cephas is the afterburner speed. He can catch the ball and he just goes. He quick excel, quick to the accelerator, and then he just goes. He also makes context, contested catches for someone that uh, is going to be criticized for his lack of size and saying, well, he's not that big, he, he's underweight. He makes contested catches in traffic. So I thought that was something that really stood out about Cephas. So that's what uh, Drew Aller's getting here. Someone that he can say, all right, I'm just going to play pitch and catch and let you go for yards after catch. And someone I can trust in one-on-one situations down the sideline. I I don't have to say, well, he's covered. I'm not going to throw it. But in order to build that trust, he's got to get in as soon as possible. But first things first, finish your academics, get your degree from Kent State, and then get on over to Penn State. Now, why else can he be the best receiver at Penn State next season? Uh, Because the number one wide receiver role is is completely wide open. Uh, And it's no disrespect to Keandre Lambert-Smith. He obviously comes to mind since he's been there now for multiple years. Uh, But he's really the only guy that I see as competition in terms of those first looks, those first reps. And Keandre Lambert-Smith is also the Z. Naturally, in this Penn State offense, I'll bring it up again. In Mike Yursich's offense, the X wide receiver is the number one wide receiver. That was Mitch. That's by design. They might not be the best receiver, but they're going to be the first look. 
And that's what Mitchell Tinsley was. That's what Jahan Dotson was. That's what Dante Cephas is going to be. So it's not only going to be the way it is on the depth chart. It's the way the offense is designed around a player like Cephas. Um, and I, I think his talent uh, is really there. He was graded as a 90 overall from on3.com in the transfer portal. The Athletic had him as the third best wide receiver in the transfer portal. He, he was a lower recruit. Some people had him as a two star, if that's even a thing. Uh, but some places had him as a three star. I, I mean, th this is a really home run get for Penn State, especially with some of the players that have been in the transfer portal and Penn State hasn't been able to come up with. Uh, so be extremely excited about this commitment. Uh, Cephas, just to relay the stats here, he had 130 catches, 1,984 yards, and nine touchdowns over two seasons. And he was first team all Mac in back to back seasons. And even better, he's got two years of eligibility left. So Penn State can not only have him for this upcoming season, but 2024 as well, when they return all that same talent, all those sophomores, Abdul Carter, Drew Aller. Nicholas Singleton, Katron Allen, Deny Dennis Sutton, they're all going to be juniors. And then you could get Dante Cephas back. Unless he lights the world on fire, then send him off to the NFL because I don't blame him if he has that kind of season. That's going to do it for me on this edition of Locked on Nittany Lions. Before I let you go, thanks again for making Locked on Nittany Lions your first listen every day. Check out the brand new show, Locked on College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college basketball in one place. And you can hear from big name experts, players, coaches, insiders, all of it on Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up next, more players are entering the transfer portal for Penn State. Marquise Wilson specifically has entered the transfer portal. Charlie Catcher was not listed on the updated roster. We'll get some updates and news around those players who Penn State could be targeting on the recruiting trail as well as it's not set in stone. The class of 2023, believe it or not, can still get bigger and better. And I mean literally bigger. Plus, we'll have special guests on as well to catch it all up. Penn State men's basketball is getting ready to play Wisconsin on Tuesday tonight when this episode goes up. So Penn State men's basketball, they got to pick up a win, and we'll be able to talk about all of that coming up. For your Penn State football and men's basketball news and all the other sports, keep it right here on Locked on Nittany Lions.